Okay, welcome everyone to this CSSR, CCSR webinar, uh, Caught in the Current British and Canadian Evangelicals in an Age of Self-Spirituality, the new book. Here it is by Sam Reimer. Congratulations, Sam, uh, on the new book. Here she is. I'm your chair for the day, uh, Sarah Wilkinson-Flam from the University of Waterloo. And so today's webinar, uh, same as usual for, for this format, we're going to about have half an hour presentation from Sam to hear about his new book. And then we'll go into Q&A uh, from those who are attending live here today. Um, before we get into that, though, I would like to make uh, the land acknowledgement for myself. I'm here in, in, in Waterloo. So here at the University of Waterloo and the Wilfrid Laurier University are both situated on the Haldeman Tract, land that was promised to the Ho uh, that was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River, and is within the territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Okay, and so Sam, I will pass the mic over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks so much, everyone who is participating today. I know some of you are marking exams and have other things to do, so I really appreciate you coming in and being part of this uh, today. And thanks again for Sarah, who is not only hosting this, but is the editor um, of the series in McGill, Queens, that this is part of. So special thanks to her. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is sort of give you an overview of at least a couple of the chapters of the book and hopefully what your appetite to read the rest and uh, the book uh, caught in the current British and, and Canadian evangelicals in the age of self-spirituality. So um, I don't have to tell this group that uh, church attendance is declining rapidly in the two countries I did interviews in, one being uh, Britain, which runs about 5% now, and uh, the other one being Canada which is declining quickly and in the 10% range. I could also tell you about disaffiliation, but uh, Clark and McDonald and Thiessen and Wilkins Laflamme have told us a lot about that process, where up to a little over half of Brits and a little and close to half of Canadians now are considered themselves religious nuns, not affiliated um, uh, with any, any religious group. So in general, we're seeing this decline in institutional religiosity across the West, uh, declining numbers of people attending, but also people volunteering in religious organizations, just the general trend. So what is this about? Well, it's obviously about the secularization trends that are going on in the world around us. Um, but uh, I'm suggesting in this book that there is with this process, a dominant cultural narrative that is pervasive in scope and is international and not only exists in people's thinking, it's a cultural narrative, it exists in people's mind maps, if you like, but it also is carried and strengthened by our major institutions, schools, uh, churches, and um, hospitals, a variety of other businesses, a variety of other institutions as well. So this is partly about that. Now, I am calling this cultural narrative, a move to an internal locus of authority. The argument here is that as a culture, over 60 to 100 years, we have transitioned from an external locus of authority where parents, uh, religious leaders, politicians, whoever, teachers, whoever it might be, uh, largely dictated to us what we should think and believe. And we are moving now toward an internal locus of authority where we are our own guides, where uh, is socially expected, culturally expected, that we ourselves come up with what we believe and what we think. So this move is not new to me by any means and has been diagnosed uh, long before we got, uh, before I was writing anything. Um, so let me just catch a few of the famous quotes here from three uh, groups. Uh, often called, by the way, a variety of things, the inward turn, uh, the subjective turn, subjectivization, a variety of other turns for what I call the inner, in, internal locus of authority. Here is famous sociologist Helis and Woodhead from Britain. Thus, subjectivization is a, if not the, major cause of such secularization in the post-war period. Uh, here we got a Canadian well-known philosopher, Charles Taylor, for many people today to set aside their own path in order to conform to some external authority just doesn't seem comprehensible as a form of spiritual life. And a few decades ago, uh, sociologist Wade Clark Roof talked about changes in religion and he states, contemporary quests for religiosity are really yearning for a reconstructed 
in her life. Even before these, uh, we saw Peter Berger talking about this in the heretical imperative back in the 1970s. And even applying this to evangelicals, which I do in this study, uh, we saw uh, uh, James Davidson Hunter talk about the way we're seeing the subjectivization of evangelicalism in the US. So not a new idea, but I hope the way I describe it is helpful for some people to capture what this cultural narrative is about. So what is this inward turn or this subjectivization or this internal locus of authority look like? Well, to, do, to explain that, a quick look at the external locus of authority, which is more typical, I would say, of the silent generation, those born before the boomers, 1945 uh, and older, uh, born previous to 1945, and that the internal locus of authority, more typical of millennials and Gen Zs, um, but of course, it's been a, a long transition uh, over many decades. Probably the, the, the key switch here has been the baby boomer population in the 60s and 70s. The internal locus of, the external, sorry, locus of authority looks like this. Um, there is a deference to institutional authority. If the priest, whoever uh, religious authority says so, I largely accept it. And I internalize it in my heart. I believe it in my heart. There's a deference to institutions and cultural norms. You could think of, you know, the wartime and just the deference to, um, you know, Uncle Sam said, or, you know, whatever the politicians say we should do, we're just uh, obedient and we do what they call us to do. Uh, beliefs, behaviors, and aspirations are prescribed to us and identity is ascribed, that is, tends to be uh, defining us at birth uh, very early on. It's ascribed to us and it tends to be fairly stable. The internal locus of authority looks more like this. Uh, now, institutional authority is suspect. It is passe. Um, and we now accept an internal authority. If we accept an external authority, it is because we ourselves freely chosen. And um, we might, you know, uh, abide by the views of an external authority for a time period or maybe for a longer time period, but it's because it matches with our own inner true selves. A consumeristic in our use of institutions, there's not this loyalty or deference to institutions. It's much more, um, if it's useful, uh, this kind of utilitarian attitude, if it's useful for me in my own personal journey, I will accept that, but I will, their, their views, but I'll pick and choose from institutional products as they become available to make something that is uniquely mine. Uh, beliefs, behaviors, and aspirations are more discovered and personally chosen, uh, not dictated to me, or uh, I don't defer to the institutional beliefs. And even if I hear some beliefs that might resonate to me, I determine whether or not they match um, with what I'm sensing in my heart. Identity then is created. It is a process and it tends to be a little more flexible as I'll suggest partly because um, it is shaped by influences around us, including our warm relationships. All right. Uh, so just to be clear, these are not two categories that are mutually exclusive, uh, the external locus of authority and, and internal locus of authority. People are a mix of both. Um, and older generations, a little more on the left-hand side, the external locus of authority. Younger generations tend to be a little more internal in their locus of authority. But the point is, where do I get my legitimate, Where where is the source of legitimate power? Where is, where does this um, authority in my life come from? And the answer as we move uh, socially, culturally to the right, to the internal locus of authority, is that it increasingly comes from my own heart. You would expect then that people who are still active in religious institutions would probably lean external authority, and people who are less active might be a little more typically internal in their authority. All right. So this internal external authority I am arguing in the book is sort of the foundation, the plate, the, 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 the base, if you like, the Marxist term, of the self-spirituality that is also a theme in the book. So by self-spirituality, uh, I draw here from many authors, uh, um, the work of Charles Taylor, obviously, uh, Galen Watts in Canada has been very helpful here, and probably his list 
in his 2002 book is most helpful for the list that I'm going to present today. Uh, Matthew Guest, Paul Helis, Linda Woodhead in Britain, Houghton and Hauptmann and Oppers in, in Belgium write a fair bit about this. Uh, so there's lots of sources that I'm drawing from here to articulate this self-spirituality. What I'm going to suggest is that this cultural narrative has a very, it's quite clear. Uh, and uh, it has both a very clear means and it has a very clear end. The instrumental part of this, the means, has several parts. First of all, uh, everybody is on a private journey. Uh, that is, I am responsible individually for my own path, and I might uh, imbibe various spiritual practices, be they yoga, meditation, mindfulness, tai chi, homeopathy, whatever it might be, um, to counter the dis-ease in my subjective well-being. But my goal is to move toward wholeness. In, uh, institutional religiosity could be helpful along the way, and to the degree that it is helpful in my personal journey toward wholeness, I will accept it, but when it no longer is, I will move on. Perennialism is the belief that at their core, all religions are really the same. That is beneath the uh, layers of historical difference and disagreement that have happened over time, there exists a common core. And that is basically to help us be good people. It is to teach us to be good and to live in social harmony with one another. And those who are enlightened, who really understand what's going on, closer to the, their true selves maybe, um, recognize that the, uh, the differences in religions are simply apparent and they are for people who aren't yet enlightened like they are. They haven't really found this inner truth. And so therefore, uh, a diversity of religions is fine. You can pick and choose from other religions and form the sort of bricolage, as Helis calls it, of spirituality to form something that is uniquely your own. Inner epistemology, how do I know? The way that I know is largely based on personal experience. What is right and wrong morality? What is true of the sacred spirituality? Is based on what I sense internally. It is consonant with what I feel in my heart. So my own intuition, my own inner voice tends to guide uh, these sort of beliefs and moral attitudes. Personal liberty is very key to uh, the self-spirituality. What that means is that I need to be free to find my own way, to be involved in my own spiritual quest. And if external authorities tie, try to squeeze me into their mold, they might disform me. And social obstacles like um, people who are doubters and don't believe in me are the kind of people who are impediments to my own finding my own way. So what I need to do is I need to remove these impediments and I need the liberty to do so. So I'm suggesting part of the reason why we emphasize so much uh, individual rights and we sacralize individual freedom is partly because of this idea of finding our own inner way. God, as Charles Taylor has made clear, has moved from the external, uh, the transcendent better, to an imminent God, the God we connect with inside, the, the God we um, bring up from inside us. It is discovered, God is, that's the word I'm looking for, accessed from the inside. Um, so what this means is that people are in are are full of an inner sacredness there there's a there's a divine inner sense of who they are their true selves and uh we could even argue then that uh the authentic self the real self inside us is indeed sacred since god exists in all these things including all people um the means is also uh um, a way to a specific telos a end that we are all striving for. And this picture of the uh, swan gliding peacefully on a calm pond is the picture of the inner self that people are working for. It's the authentic self, the real self, the self that has experienced wholeness and inner peace. So the end then is finding the authentic self. We are on a journey toward a telic end and that telic end, this telos, is the authentic me. 
my real self. We are told to be true to ourselves. We are, to, are told to be who we are, not let other people tell us who we are to be. So this true self, of course, is something that only I can discover because it's I'm an original. I'm not like anybody else. And so I have to find it myself, even though other people can help me along the way. There actually are two selves. This authentic self is the real self, the natural self, the self that we are striving for. But there's also a mundane self, a inauthentic self, a unnatural self, a socialized self, which has been deformed by society around us and the doubters and the oppressive powers that exist. So to find our own true spiritual self, uh, we have to get behind, beyond, above the mundane self in order to find the authentic self. Uh, the authentic self then is not good and bad, as sort of as traditional Christianity and other religions would, would view it. Uh, that is, it's sinful, but it is, once it is found, it is good. It is divinely good. Uh, the bad we have, of course, is when we have not yet found our true self, and also this authentic self is, once we find it, is got its, got its own superpower. It is powerful. It is a uh, good, pure, whole, uh, joyful, um, but it is also very powerful. And once this inner potential is released, we can really uh, have an impact on the world. Of course, external uh, forces, as I suggested, are roadblocks along the way. External authorities can distort the true self. And so if I have not yet found my true self, um, I have insecurities or fears or I'm unkind or whatever else. These are signs that I am yet to find who I really am and release this inner goodness that exists in my authentic self. It is also my responsibility to find that. So I can't blame other people. Ultimately, I have to get past the forces that have shaped me and begin to find it. So lots of authors are saying that this kind of zeitgeist, this kind of self-spirituality is powerful and dominant in the West. Um, so I thought, well, if it is powerful and dominant in the West, then does it show up in those religious groups? I mentioned Galen Watts's book here, uh, The Spiritual Turn. Um, which is uh, the source of uh, the best source, in my view, of the list that I'm drawing from. I encourage you to get that one. Um, anyway, so what's the study? Well, the study was: Am I going to find this in a group of Christians who are, by definition, external authority people? That is, they are people who abide by the book. They are people who are defer to biblical authority, um, and the historic creeds, they're orthodox people. Um, will I find that even among active evangelical laity? That is, I asked the clergy in 67 churches in England and Canada um, if they were perceiving evidence of the inner turn. Of course, I didn't ask it in that way, but uh, in a variety of, of questions, what they were seeing in, uh, from the pulpit. And I asked 57 laity, and these laity were selected by their clergy. They're all active in their churches. So I'm stacking against the, the deck against my likelihood of finding people who are internal authority kinds of people. Uh, yet what I found, and the clergy were very clear about this that I talked to, that this is coming into the churches, in evangelical churches, and is shaping the way uh, evangelical laity, even active laity, think. So uh, my sample included a wide variety of denominations, Anglican, Evangelical Anglican, that is, uh, known for their uh, conservativeness, I guess, among the Anglicans, independent churches, network churches, Baptists, uh, RCCG, that's the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Nigeria, which is growing like crazy in both countries, along with a lot of other uh, majority black churches, particularly in London, other places like that, Hillsong churches, vineyard churches, and the sort. All right. So what I'm going to talk about now is one chapter where I talk about evidence of this self-spirituality, this internal locus of authority, beginning to uh, find its way into the beliefs of evangelicals. So let me talk a little bit about 
what we understand beliefs are, and then a little bit about um, how we see beliefs changing over time. And then finally, a little bit of evidence from the interviews themselves. So uh, I'm drawing here from Abby Day, particularly in Britain. And uh, she argues that beliefs are in her book, uh, be uh, Believing is Belonging, I believe it's called, get that right? Believing in Belonging, get that right? And uh, her and Gordon Lynch wrote a piece called uh, uh, Belief in Culture, Belief as Cultural Performance as well. The argument here is that beliefs have less to do with individual assent to intellectual propositions, which are often laid down, say, in a creed or other religious doctrine, and is much more to do with relationships and our emotive connection to certain groups or flagging ourselves in different places as, uh, as this kind of a person, more to tying, tying in emotively with our identity. So the argument here is that when uh, Abby Day studied uh, young people in Britain, uh, what she found was that belief was understood to be three sort of things. One was a, mar a marker of cultural identity where people flagged sort of a flag waving thing where I'm saying it's performative, she says, where I'm saying I believe these things because I'm this kind of person. I'm an open minded Canadian and therefore I believe, you know, um, all religions are all world religions are valid or something like that. So they hold to those kinds of things, similar and evangelical. I'm a Bible believing person because I'm an evangelical. I'm marking my beliefs as related to my identity. A second part of this is this, this relational piece, an expression of significant social relationships and networks of belonging. So I'm saying these are my mates and I uh, am shaped by their, I'm shaped by my warm relationships in what I believe, uh, but I am also um, connecting with my peeps, with my fellow, uh, with, with my mates. Um, by sharing sort of my beliefs and them resonating with them. Uh, finally, a subgroup, a small subgroup of uh, Abby Day and Gordon Lynch's research was that uh, beliefs became, was an organizing center of individual and group life, which sounds much more like an evangelical, um, something that where they all abide by these doctrines or creeds that they all share together. But what I'm suggesting is that, what she's suggesting is that beliefs are becoming increasingly anthropocentric, human-centric, and less theocentric, and are increasingly shaped by belonging, by connection with other people, which would mean that they would be le typically a little more fluid and a little more based on those warm relationships than we previously understand. So am I finding then uh, this uh, some transition within evangelicalism toward this more relational, a little more fluid belief? Well, we can now go to our friends in Norway, who, uh, who uh, Paul Rebstadt and his researchers have uh, studied evangelicals in situ in uh, Norway for many years. And over time, they found that this kind of change happened in the religious beliefs. First of all, giant change was primarily intergenerational. That is, the next generation was less orthodox or whatever it might be than the previous generation and that uh, practice experience normally came first. That is, they changed their cultural relationships, they broadened them, uh, they might have, have been less insular in their activities, like they go out and they join, you know, secular sport league, sports, sports leagues or whatever else. So they're moving outside of the bubble, if you like, and uh, they do this without explicit theological reflection. The theological legitimations for changing beliefs tend to come later on. That is, they're slowly absorbing this based on relational change. Uh, another kind, not all of it's intergenerational, some of it's life course. So as people age, sometimes they find that as their relational uh, networks expand, that they're good people who are outside of their religious group. And these are, uh, they used to be part of out groups and now are increasingly in groups because they have friends there. And so they began to change their beliefs in light of those relational changes. Uh, and then uh, after time, there's pressure both internally, that is progressive evangelical critics in my case, and externally non-evangelicals, cultural pressure to change beliefs in a more maybe accepting or open position. And then finally, uh, there is justifications. Uh, Repstad has now found, there's these, oops, source. Um, 
uh, for this is a higher good. So they will say things like, uh, well, going to uh, being involved in the baseball league instead of going to church uh, makes good sense because it's important family time, or I might have opportunity to share my faith or whatever else it might be. And then moral views are much more likely to change than dogma. So people are much more likely to change due to social pressure, things like their attitudes toward uh, same-sex marriage or premarital sex or um, the exclusiveness of, uh, yeah, things like that change to change uh, more quickly than do dogma, like their belief that Jesus uh, is the divine son of God or something. So uh, that's what Repstat found along with his co-authors. And so I'm seeing in this, some of this move toward an inner authority. And I think I see it in my uh, interviews. So what does this look like? Well, it would be wrong to argue that this looks like linear accommodation. That is, this is straight sort of a move toward more liberal positions. Uh, what we see is much more of a negotiation in their faith and a tension between what they perceive to be acceptable in society and what they want to hold on to as evangelicals. So what I found dominantly among my interview, interviews is what I call a qualified belief. It could even be called a qualified orthodox belief. So they hold on to the position, even if it's a bit unpopular, but they soften it and make it ironic so that it's much more palatable to people who don't share their beliefs. Let's look at a few examples of how this happened. Uh, one strategy for qualifying belief is to separate my views from other people's views. So that is, unlike during Christendom, when everybody was expected to hold to uh, the doctrinal positions and the moral positions of the church, uh, now we, uh, there is a tendency even among the evangelicals to say, well, this is my view but other people might disagree with me on that. And particularly, I don't expect people who are not Christian or not evangelical to hold my views. And so there was this separation of my views from others, this shrinking of the scope into which my, my views apply. They become much more personal, much more inner. So my example here of an Anglican male in Toronto, uh, my view on premarital sex and, and cohabitation is also the same um, sorry, I can't see all my print because I got a picture of uh, some of you in the corner here, uh, but it would be, but you can see it, I hope, uh, because that's how I learned it. But I try not to uh, force, I guess, others to be of the same belief. Uh, that's kind of my view. So we don't want to pressure other people to hold on to my views. What I saw a lot of, by the way, that strikes me as um, increasingly uh, internal with its authority. That is, this is what I believe, but I don't expect other people to hold that as well. Another common strategy was uh, I heard a lot of I used to believe. And what the suggestion is with these is I'm now more sophisticated or open-minded than I used to be. And I used to be much more dogmatic, narrow, fundamentalist, whatever the word might be, uh, than I am now on this view. And so there's this softening of this view to make it more palatable to other people, even if I kind of still hold to it. So if you're asking me on a survey, you know, do you believe this? I would probably still say yes. So if you were to ask me when I was 11 and 12, this is a young um, woman from an independent uh, network church in uh, Newcastle, England. Uh, if you asked me when I was 11 and 12, I would have said that God is, has not designed us to be gay. God designed us to be straight. I don't believe that anymore. I do believe the Bible describes marriage as something between a man and a woman. So you can see the tension here, right? Tension toward the orthodox position and yet trying to be open-minded, but the heart of God is so much more saddened by the demonization of people who don't accept this extremely narrow view of sexual expression. Um, another way is to come across, is to try to avoid being judgmental. So this isn't actually a lay person. This is actually a pastor of an independent church in Manchester. And here we're talking about abortion. We were never going to be one to judge people who have had an abortion in the sense of being judgmental because it's not going to help us to make them feel bad. So we would encourage people to consider alternatives. So against abortion, still conservative position, but I'm not going to be judgmental about this. What normally happens, by the way, in this position is that they're just silent on the issue. So the question is a fair question raised by other academics is, 
uh, Rubstat being one of them, is if we are silent on an issue because it's controversial, um, does that actually mean beliefs stay the same, especially if you're on the pulpit, right? Or do beliefs naturally change because there's general silence from the pulpit on that issue? Another uh, example is this problem of conflicting commitments. So here we have a vineyard person from Eastern Canada. On abortion, I'm not a, I'm 100% fan of women being able to be authors of their own fate and their own bodies, but I think that the Bible is fairly clear about the importance of life and our role in that, again, attention. So I am torn on that issue. So uh, somewhat convenient possibly, as this interview suggests, is that um, I haven't made up my mind yet, and so I don't have to commit to something that would be seen as unacceptable or uh, intolerant or non-affirming of other people. And so if I have still working on that issue kind of position, uh, then I remain more open to it. So this is just a smattering of examples and I do a much, much more greater, much greater detail in the book where I'm showing this, uh, this move, which is much more relational a lot less about uh, intellectual assent to a creed, a doctrine, and much more about a negotiation, much more an inner journey, much more a, uh, a personal uh, thing than what we probably have seen in the past. All right, uh, that's just a quick look. And um, it, I talk a fair bit about how I see this inner turn or this inward turn, this internal locus of authority uh, shaping behaviors. Uh, religious practice among evangelicals. I talk about how it makes church, uh, uh, sorry, religious transmission to the next generation, passing on our faith to the next generation, uh, increasingly difficult because if everybody has their own inner path, then it's pretty hard to pass on my path <laughs> to my children. Uh, so that becomes increasingly dis difficult. I talk a little bit about how uh, the structure, um, the actual way churches are set up is changing. Immigration, of course, is changing some of the way churches, uh, the demographics and other parts of the church and the way they're structured, um, uh, moving forward a little bit more experiential and emotive side of the way we operate. So anyway, all that stuff is in the book, but I have to leave you with that and hopefully uh, we'll be interested to check that out uh, in the book. Again, thanks so much for paying attention. I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks so much, Sam. Oh, oh, questions, so many questions. All right, it's time for questions. Uh, so as I mentioned, you can raise your virtual hand. So oh, Andrew's already got us going. Um, or you can post your questions in the chat or just an indication that you'd like to, to ask a question in the chat and then I'll kind of, I'll uh, monitor it. And maybe Sam, if you um, stop, sharing your screen we can maybe see every button a bit better if that's easy to do okay yeah perfect thank you okay so andrew go ahead hi sam thanks for your presentation lots of connections to my own teaching in the area of spirituality um question i have and i'm thinking back both to your um to your dissertation looking at where you gently highlighted some differences between canadian and, and american um, evangelicalism, also thinking of historical work of Brian Stanley, looking at how Canadian evangelicals have been much more shaped in the past by the Brits in, in a more ironic way. And so when you say that these Canadian and UK, that there's this shift towards a more ironic posture instead of being hardline orthodox, you're accounting for this as being part of a, a shift of locus of authority to being more inward. Is that particular then to Canadians and Brits and not so present in the U.S.? Or do you think this is universal across sort of the Anglo world? Um, I'm just wondering if you might speculate at least about some of those implications in our North American context. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, so, yes, I would say the inner turn, uh, the inward turn that I talk about is much broader than uh, North America or even uh, the U.K., uh, it exists definitely in other Western countries like Australia, uh, but the evidence uh, suggests that it exists even in Asian countries and, and around the world. So this is a powerful kind of uh, even media uh, influenced trend that I see much bigger uh, than just the West. So so yes, it, it, it's a bigger it's a it's a it's a big trend. And um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's affecting groups 
uh, not not only Christians, but much more broadly across the way. And some experts in uh, Buddhism or, or Islam or something else will have to speak to that. But I think it's it's quite uh, it's carried powerfully in our institutions and uh, spread quite broadly uh, across all kinds of, of cultures. OK, Katie, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sam. I really appreciated getting the chance to learn from you again <laughs> as a former student. I always love it when I get that opportunity and excited to read the book eventually. I just wondered about your findings a little bit based on what you talked about. These different strategies, the separating my view from others, I used to believe, presenting as though one has like kind of conflicting commitments. Were you treating those as kind of factual statements about where these people were at in their beliefs or more as rhetorical strategies? Does that make sense? Like yes, the right thing to say for that audience based on what I think the audience might want to hear. Like I want to present myself in a particular way. And so I, I'm going to kind of word it like this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the question is related to how they perceived me. Um, and I tried to come in as knowledgeable, but not, uh, you know, fly my flag very clearly. Uh, but if we accept Abby Day's argument that beliefs are partially performative, uh, that is, they, they are a flag waving saying, this is how I locate myself in my identity, uh, then we would expect that to be true of evangelicals as well. So evangelicals are also communicating in a way to put their best foot forward. There's no doubt about that. And so in that sense, they are, uh, it's partly performative. Um, so, uh, but I think that's what I'm picking up generally in the 20 plus churches uh, where I also did observations um, during my travels was that uh, they don't lead with the, what would be viewed as the narrow-minded. They would be leading with this open, welcoming, we want everybody to come, we're accepting. Um, and I heard more and more, even among clergy, things like, well, our job is to lead people to Jesus and then let him do the convicting of sin. And so it wasn't really my job to sort of, be, you know, uh, pound the pulpit and say, this is good and this is not good. Um, instead, uh, we let the Holy Spirit convict and that's an inner thing. So we're seeing some of that uh, inner understanding of the way that operates. Uh, let me just say also, evangelicalism is not innocent in the move to an inter internal locus of authority, okay? So uh, evangelicalism fed into this sort of personal faith thing that's also uh, made that move in that direction. So um, yes, partly performative. I think I got your question, Katie. Yeah, 100%. I just think that's really interesting because um, I can think of examples or, or times I've seen that happen for myself or in other research too. So yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right, John Longhurst, you have you posted in the chat a, a question. Do you want to ask it, or I can paraphrase it for you if you like? <laughs> All right, I'm going to paraphrase John's question. So, John, you can see it maybe Sam in the chat is is asking, you know, this move towards the internal locus of authority. Um, is is it good for the stereotypes we have of evangelicals <laughs> coming from the outside? Do you think it's going to help uh, alleviate some of those negative stere stereotypes maybe non-evangelicals have of evangelicals? John, if um, you're there, you can... Yeah, I, I'm the here. And, and, <laughs> and that's, you, so, you right? see the question, yeah. So you yeah. know the stereotype that they're all of the same kind because we see the same American television evangelists. But uh, wouldn't this, Sam, make, um, you know, soften that image? They're not, they're not as judgmental as you might think. Um, well, I guess it depends how widely my book is written, John. Um, but uh, the answer is uh, evangelicals in Canada and Britain, for that matter, have always been sort of under the shadow of the eagle, and they tend to be painted with the same brush. And because um, the media often covers the uh, mo the least, maybe the least ironic voices within evangelicalism, those are the ones that tend to... Uh, distinguish evangelicals uh, regardless of which uh, side of the border they are on. Let me also be really clear, as I point out in the book, that uh, British and Canadian evangelicals work very hard to distinguish themselves from American stereotypes. And so they worked hard to di distinguish themselves from that. And they were all very aware that they don't have a great you know, public image. And they also are very aware, and they, they blame the U.S. for a fair bit of that. Uh, so they're very aware of that, and so they work hard to demonstrate the opposite spirit, if you like. 
Hmm. Um, will this change the general perception of evangelicals out there? Uh, uh, I don't, I'm not super optimistic on that one. Um, I'm not sure how many people will rub shoulders uh, in evangelical churches if they already have a view about them and uh, pick up a different sort of spirit. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, here we are. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen there in spite of maybe some evangelicals' best efforts. And so I have a question, Sam. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll please, take sir. this chance to, to insert my question. Um, so you mentioned quickly the religious transmission topic, right? And so I, I and you mentioned that you know this move towards the internal locus of authority and the values that go with it and the way of thinking that go with it. Um, often leads to a difficulty in passing on the faith to the next generation, right? And I've been seeing something similar with the kind of interviews and focus groups that uh, the Cascadia project with Paul did with some millennials, as well as uh, another project I'm on in Quebec did with some millennials. And this kind of those uh, amongst the millennials who were religiously active in these kind of very non-religious environments out west and in Quebec, for the most part, we're, we're kind of having this struggle, right? Because the onus was on them to pass on the faith to their kids, and they really did want to pass mm -hmm. on their faith to the kids. The kids are not going to pick it up from school or from the general environment because that there's very little kind of religiosity in that environment. And so, but they're, they're this struggle, right? They want to pass on this faith. It's very important to them, but they also want to, you know, pass on the values of open-mindedness, of, of thinking for yourself, of, yeah, finding your authentic itself of free thinking like these kind of individualism values right that they're part of this internal locus of authority they want their kids to be able to think for themselves and make their own choices and decisions and so you know and so i'm wondering is is there kind of are more actively religious parents who are involved with religious groups are they kind of faced with two options either a more a move towards a more external locus of authority way of thinking when it comes to raising their kids right just especially in the early years just kind of passing stuff on through the faith or a kind of failed religious transmission on the other hand if they decide to still go with the very kind of open internal uh, locus of authority way of doing things right so are they are there other options have you kind of did you chat more with your interviewees about ways that they're kind of navigating this struggle? Yes, uh, great point, Sarah. And um, uh, we, we know the data here. Um, I mean, we're losing uh, a big third within evangelicalism in the half to two thirds among other Christian traditions, uh, people um, becoming uh, uh, non-affiliated uh, from previous affiliation. Of course, it depends how active the parents were and all kinds of things. But yes, the parents do feel responsible among the evangelicals, uh, particularly, but this tends to be true uh, more broadly than evangelicals. So, and they're also very aware that they can't force their kids to believe certain things because of this increasing internal locus of authority uh, that exists in our society. And because um, they know that the kids will likely rebel if they try to get too heavy handed with the kids. So, what they try to do, the strategy seems to be stack the deck in your favor with the positive influences. So what that means is you're very eager to drive them to youth group and uh, you're very quick to encourage them to be friends with another evangelical family. And you are encouraging them to go to camp and a mission trip and these sort of things, which kind of stack the deck in your favor. Uh, Chris Smith in his uh, book on um, par uh, religious parenting, says it's like getting in the car while your kids are asleep in the back and driving for three hours into the woods and then waking the kids up and say, do you want to go to the art museum four hours back in the city or are you guys going to go for a walk in the woods? And it's that kind of strategy of trying to set it up in a way that is not oppressive yet stacks the deck in your behavior. So that's what I'm seeing evangelical parent strategies uh, to be about. They want to go to a church that has a vibrant youth group that the kids want to go to. And they're hoping that that kind of, um, you know, uh, closing of the network, if you like, is going to be a strategy that's going to help them uh, with their faith transmission. So, so is that what you'd recommend? Like, it's often a question we get from church leaders, from people who are active within churches. Is that, is that the strategy you'd recommend to them if they wanted to successfully, like, ha have the most chances of successfully passing on the faith to their kids so that their kids are still active in their religious group as adults themselves? I would say that's probably as good as we can do. The other thing to think about is that a lot of the influences on our kids are not other people. It's online. And so there has to be some sort of idea of how that 
uh, effect is shaping them. And, uh, you know, we get parents trying to control that and that's really difficult to do when it's not, you know, the phone in the family room or the TV set in the living room. Instead, it's their private device in their own room behind a closed door. And so it becomes increasingly hard for a religious parent to shape those kind of relationships that are growing uh, online or those kind of influences that are coming in, in law online. So it becomes increasingly complex, not only because of the internal locus of authority, but because of the prolifer prol uh, proliferation of views that are out there on the internet and other sources. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Other questions? Still got time. Don't be shy. You guys can just jump in, post in the chat. I can see some serious thinking going on as you guys are staring to the screen. I'm sure there's questions. Sarah, I've got a question. Go for it. I was looking for my digital hand, but couldn't find it. So I'll just raise my Fine, real Sam. hand. Go for it. <laughs> hey, Sam, how does this impact uh, the ethnic groups that are coming to this country, Canada, coming to Canada and setting up shop here? I, I kind of have a sense of what's happening to their second generation. But it seems to me that they, within one generation, is going from the kind of the top down to the internal uh, by the time they get to the second generation. You got any data on what's happening, like, say, with Filipino groups, Korean groups, um, or even the Nigerian groups that are coming here who are setting up church and look like they're doing really well? How are they with passing the faith on to their children who are growing up in Canadian culture? Okay, I probably said too much. You can jump on it wherever you want to grab a piece of that. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so so two factors here. And I'm actually going to, I think it's a great question, and I don't have a lot of data in my head, but I'm almost sure there's some people who are in this call who do. So uh, feel free to jump in here, um, some of the others of you. So uh, what matters, one of the things that matters here is the numbers that are coming in within each camp. So will evangelicalism grow partly because there are high numbers of evangelicals that are immigrating to Canada? And then the other question is, uh, how long do they hold on or do they hold on to their faith once they land here and we get to the second generation and that sort of thing? Yeah. So um, uh, the answer is it depends a bit on the group. Uh, for evangelicals right now, uh, the number who are coming in are slightly higher than the number who exist. And so that bodes well for growth there. Other groups are doing better. Obviously, the other world religions are doing much better uh, in this area. Um, I can say with some confidence that Muslims are holding on to their youth better than some of the other groups, uh, but um, uh, and evangelicals hold on to the youth better than other Christian groups, uh, partly because of their high investment in uh, youth programming and uh, camps and mission trips and this sort of thing. Uh, but uh, beyond that, uh, there's a fair bit of drop-off in my senses. It's not unlike the degree of drop-off that we're seeing in native-born Canadians, but I'd be interested in other people speaking to that. Yeah, I was looking at the, the 2020 uh, General Social Survey stats from Canada that actually has a question on people's religious childhood, religion and childhood. And so it's it's interesting, like the evangelical groups seem to have very high turnover, right? They get people in through immigration and through religious transmission, but then they also lose a high number. It's like a, it's kind of like a, a, a quicker revolving door for evangelicals, a bit more than other groups. Whereas like say Sikhs are just, they've got lots of people in and they just keep their people in. And, and so, and, and so there's kind of, even amongst evangelical immigrants, there's more of that turnover than, say, in other world religions, like you're mentioning, Sam. Yeah. No, very cool. Anyone else want to jump in with a comment or a question? Paul, is that a hand? I could try something here, uh, oh. Sarah. Okay, go for it, Peter. I'm just thinking, Sam, like, to, to, to a large degree, the, the subjectivization of religion is a cultural thing. And if it's cultural, then it's external, but it's perceived as internal. And um, how, do, how do you deal with that little contradiction, not contradiction, paradox there? Yeah. And what cultural institutions that are external to the self are the main ones that are constructing this kind of religiosity? Yeah. It's, uh, I, I talk about it in the book, Peter, and it's a great question. Um, it is true that the uh, 
culture is prescribing, that might be too strong of a word, but that's, I think, a okay word, um, a certain expectation on people that they are the authors of their own beliefs and practices, religious beliefs and practices. Um, so that is an external influence. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, Galen Watts talks about this as well in his book, uh, but the argument, of course, is that from a sociological perspective, being a sociologist, uh, the, you know, the human who comes up with their own beliefs, practices, attitudes, identities from some inner source within them, uh, without being shaped by the social forces around us is, is fiction. It would be uh, there, the social forces around us do shape us, uh, regardless of what is considered ideal or what is it expected. So that, uh, so yeah, uh, the, the difference I think um, over the last 60 to 100 years is not that society has stopped prescribing norms and values and expectations. It's that society is now prescribing that you come up with those, even though those are still shaped by particularly warm relationships around you. Um, so institutionally, uh, who's carrying this? Well, schools are carrying this um, idea of kind of finding your own self and discovering who you are. Um, uh, I think we're finding in a lot of uh, the emphasis toward the client-focused uh, individualization of a lot of services uh, across the board in other institutions. So that would be, and institutions now, as Woodhead and other have argued, have argued that uh, they really talk about, they don't talk about their beliefs, they talk about values. And we value these sort of generic, um, you know, uh, human, accepted human goods uh, that um, that also sort of carry this, this zeitgeist. So, uh, yeah. Paul, did you have a question? You kind of... Yeah. There was like half a hand raised. Unmuted. There is a hand. It's, just, it's, <laughs> a, dark, for it. it's a dark skin. Oh, hand. yes. I see it now. I'm, yeah, it was yeah, behind I'm, your I'm, brown I'm, cabinet. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to mess mess with the norms that Zoom gives us. Um, so, Sam, thanks very much for this. It sounds like a great book. I can't wait to read it. Um, I'm really interested in the kind of national contrast that you sketched a little bit. Like you kind of mentioned that actually throughout the history of the study of evangelicalism, the way in which British and Canadian evangelicals always have to play themselves off the American fact, especially as it presents itself in the in the media in this kind of bloated Trumpian kind of way. Yeah, I'm kind of curious about the what you're observing as a difference in the generations. By that I mean, so you know, people in their 50s and 60s and 70s who you might have talked to would have had fairly clear sense of the difference between British, Canadian, and American evangelicals, but people under let's say 40 who let's say are more aware of or plugged into social media, I'm wondering if those sort of national differences begin to fade a little bit. Uh, certainly in the phenomenon I'm looking at right now, which is postural yoga, the sort of differences in the, in the national, capital N, national formal state differences is, is, seems to me to be a bit spongy. And I wonder if you're sensing that difference in the generations as well, that the 70 year olds are very clear about wanting to be different than the Americans, yeah. And the 35 year olds are kind of like, well, I'm not sure what that would actually mean because maybe I'm just part of a broader media zeitgeist, which isn't about borders and currency and who's the president and so forth. So yeah. I'm wondering if you notice that. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And I'm trying to think back on my interviews, which were way too long ago now, Paul. Um, and um, I was doing these interviews in 2018. And so we're right in the middle of Trump's term and his um, notoriety um, was widespread uh, in uh, across the ages in Britain and in Canada. And when I talk to people about differences between British evangelicalism and Canadian evangelicalism, uh, they were basically couldn't come up with anything. Even evangelicals who had lived in both countries couldn't foil between those two. They could only foil between Canada, Britain, and the U.S. Like the U.S. was the only foil that they could work with. I had a couple vague, well, well, uh, Brits, you know, are more comfortable going to going to the pub, you know, and things like that. Uh, there wasn't there wasn't much there. Um, among the the younger, um, I would say that I. Uh, uh, younger being even younger than 35. 
Uh, so we're talking people in their 20s probably. Uh, a general apathy about things political probably led to some non-interest in those kind of foils between the two countries. But I didn't notice that in people in their 30s. And you're right, they were pretty staunch all the way up to, you know, the oldest people in their 80s that I interviewed. So not a big one there, but it's what you say is interesting. I expect it's probably true had I been attending to it more. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Thanks, Sam, again, for your presentation, for all the great questions. I just have a couple announcements before we head out. Um, so, uh, like Sam mentioned, this this Sam's book here, I have the hard copy up. Uh, Sam's book is part of this Advancing Studies in Religion uh, book series that we have with McGill Queen's University Press and that I am currently the editor of. And so, uh, you have a, a kind of a view here of some of the more recent books. They're all part of the series. It's a great series, so go and check it out, and the link is on the slide here and you know if you're if you have a book in mind if you're working on that beautiful book if it's 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 going in the oven you're working on it uh please think of this this uh publishing uh venue for for your manuscript we're always looking for new innovative studies on uh, religion either within canada outside of canada on different topics within religion and so please do reach out to me or go and check us out on the website uh, if you're interested and uh it's this was the the last CSSR webinar for this acad academic year. It's the, the term is over. Everyone, hopefully everyone's done teaching and soon the marking will be over too. But we do have another big event coming up and this one is in person for the first time in uh, since the start of the pandemic. Uh, we're going to be at Congress. Uh, so at the end of May, the CSSR is having their annual meeting. It's back to how we used to do it in person. So it's over about three days over that last weekend of May. And so we're going to be at the University of York. And so I think many of you have have papers that you're planning on presenting and sessions there and so I hope to see many of you there you're always welcome just to attend even if you're not uh, uh, presenting at the conference and so please do uh, come by if you're in the area and you want to check check out the the conference and uh, I hope to see many of you there and uh, if I if I do I'll, I'll we'll have fun we'll go out and have some drinks for in person for the first time <laughs> in many years but if I don't I wish you all a happy spring and summer and uh, yeah we'll, we'll take it back up in the fall where we'll have more more webinars that's that's the plan so thanks everyone thanks for coming thanks again sam and you all have a have a good week thanks everyone for coming really appreciate it